Light bell, you know, or not the light bell, the bell rang. So I ma imagine there'll be a couple of other kids coming in, but we might as well get started. Boy, I was looking at this test, and it is a hard one. It's a good thing you kids came to this review session. Now, a couple of things to note here. That one, when you take the test on Thursday, you know, you have a lot of time between now and then to, to get ready. But there are several exception questions where they say all of the following except. Those are, those are tougher. You have to read those carefully, you know, to make sure you should read everything carefully. Now, the, the test is going to start with the election of 1824, right? So, and in chapter 13. In chapter 13, we'll have probably more than any of the other four chapters, more questions in it. Definitely more, right? Definitely more. Probably 20, um, maybe more of the questions will be out of chapter 13. And that's Jackson, right? And Jackson came into our picture in our conversation with the election of 1824. If you remember, in terms of that election of 1824, there were four Republican candidates for president. One of them was Andrew Jackson, widely thought to be the least qualified because he had the least experience in government. Another was Henry Clay, who was from Kentucky and had been the, and was the seated speaker of the House and intimately involved in a lot of the things that had happened, including the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which Clay was largely responsible for orchestrating. Another was William Crawford, who was the seated Secretary of Treasury in the Monroe administration. And Monroe, remember, was retiring from the, from the presidency. Another was John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy Adams was the Secretary of State in the Monroe administration. So you had four candidates, all claimed to be Republicans. The Federalist Party had pretty much faded away. There was no Federalist candidate that opposed um, Monroe in 1820, and so now there are four Republicans. And we know what happened. Who got the most votes in this election, electoral and popular? Say it, uh, Robbie, don't call me Bobby. Jackson got the most votes, but he was not elected by the Electoral College. Why not, Donovan? He got the most votes, popular and electoral, but he was not elected by the Electoral College. Why not? He did not receive 50% of the votes. So, Tad, where did the election go? House of Representatives. There they, they, they picked amongst the top three vote getters. Uh, Henry Clay is going to use his influence in order to get John Quincy Adams to be elected to the presidency, which he is. What does Adams do after he is chosen by the House as president that becomes controversial? Does anybody remember besides the instructor? Now, Jillian, do you recall Adams' action in terms of an appointment in the wake of being elected president that becomes very controversial? Go ahead, Jillian, tell the kids. No, 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 that's Jackson a little later. But he makes, a, Adams makes a very controversial cabinet decision. Who does he choose as his Secretary of State? Clay. Clay. And this is, what, what, do, what do the Jackson people refer to this as? Uh, kind of taking his successor. And they, they called it what? It was picking his successor, as you said, and they called it something. Do you remember what they called it? The question on the test about this, they called it a corrupt bargain, right? A corrupt bargain. What was, dear Olivia, the corrupt bargain, you ask me? Well, here's what it was. The corrupt bargain was that Clay used his influence in order to get Adams elected by the House of Representatives. In return for that, Adams chose Clay to be Secretary of State, which in essence was naming his successor. Now, was there a corrupt bargain? That we don't know. Right? We don't know what kinds of conversation occurred, but we do know that the Jackson people believed that their man, Andrew Jackson, had been robbed of the presidency. And they declared a corrupt bargain, and both Clay and Adams will, will, will um, be, be saddled by that the rest of their political careers. Now, we know Adams goes on to be a relatively unsuccessful president for a number of reasons. One, his nationalistic vision was out of touch with the direction of the country. We said that, that, that he had none of the, the, quali or none of the, not the qualifications, but none of the characteristics of a good politician. 
right? He didn't necessarily want to pander to, um, to what kind of interests were out there. He wanted to assert what he thought was best. And this does not um, endear him to the public uh, at all. And so Adams has a very unsuccessful presidency. The Jackson people are conspiring to elect Jackson in 28, which they are successful in doing so. Now we said that when Jackson is inaugurated to the presidency in 28, a large crowd of people come to Washington to watch Jackson's inauguration, right? And that, that huge crowd of common people that come for the first time to engage in, in, um, in the inauguration is kind of a symbol of Jackson's ideology and what he's about, the common man becoming involved and influential in government. Now, initially, the two things that Jackson is going to be initially famous for in his first administration is one, the spoil system or rotation in office. Is there a difference between the spoil system and rotation in office? Josh. Uh, my feelings are hurt, but he doesn't. Yes, go ahead. No, there's not. There's not a difference. You know, in both circumstances, what Jackson was doing is replacing a tenth of the federal government workforce with people he believed to be loyal to him, right? Now, his critics, Josh, called it the spoil system and argued that Jackson was using his power of appointment to strengthen his own position by rewarding people who were supportive of him. Jackson defends it as rotation in office, saying that he was giving more people an opportunity to participate in government and to have these jobs which were easy enough to do, and he was breaking the power of an appointed aristocracy, right? So they're, they're basically the same thing, but what they end up being is Jackson removing some people from, from appointed offices, like postmasters and, and treasury officials and people in ports and other places that were employed by the federal government removing them and replacing them with people of his choosing. And, and, and what his critics argued is this was a way to enhance his own power and to build his own strength. What he argued, it was democratic, right? The second thing that's going to happen in Jackson's first term, we did not directly talk about in class, but it was Indian removal. Everybody that wrote an essay discussed Indian removal. And it was, I mean, I should feel bad about this. It was the best used thing that anybody used. It was something I talked nothing about, right? You know, so um, it was almost everyone that used it used it effectively. It, it you know, it made sense. It, it saved like a number of papers from 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 generally, you know, maybe even a C to a B because they used it effectively. And what most, basically most of you argue is that you could not consider the Jacksonians to be defenders of individual liberty given Indian removal. Right? And, and you know what transpired with Indian removal. There were the civilized tribes, and some of you wrote fairly well about this. The five civilized tribes, by, by Western standards, in Georgia and in the Southwest, who had basically adopted Western ways in an attempt to maintain their ancestral homelands, and that Jackson and his supporters wanted them removed, demanded that they sell or leave their land, and moved to Oklahoma. When, he re when they resisted, he removed them with force. And we generally call this the Trail of Tears. Jackson is going to be responsible for the Indian Removal Act of 1830, right? That pushed for Indian removal. Now, another issue that's going to occur in Jackson's uh, first administration and spill over into his second has to do with nullification. Now, nullification is the brainchild of John C. Calhoun. And it was proposed in the South Carolina Exposition and Protest by Calhoun in 1828. So 1828, Calhoun writes the South Carolina Exposition and Protest proposing the notion of nullification. What was the South Carolina Exposition and Protest a response to? Slavery. 
Why was Calhoun raising this possibility of nullifying federal law? What was it a response to? Yes. Yes. Tariff that was passed in 1828 that was called the Tariff of Abomination. What, what was the idea of nullification? What did Calhoun argue? Yes, go ahead, Judge. Uh, that the Constitution was a compact between the different states, and that means that they're able to uh, disagree with something that's passed. Well, let's, let's, let's start with that. Calhoun did argue that the Constitution was a compact among sovereign states, and those states could judge the constitutionality of federal law. And they could do so by calling a special convention. And in that convention, determining whether a piece of federal law was consistent with the Constitution. If they deemed it inconsistent, they could nullify that federal law within the borders of their state. Right? And if after that nullification there was not a successful resolution between the national government and that state, that state could secede from the Union. Now, did South Carolina secede, or excuse me, they did not secede, but did South Carolina nullify a federal law in 1832? Yes. All right? What was Jackson's response to that? What was Jackson's, what, what was the total response to Jackson, South, South Carolina? Yes. The FORCE Act was passed by Congress to, to, to say to South Carolina that Jackson had the authority to use force to enforce federal law. In addition to the FORCE Act, what also transpired? Uh, go ahead, uh, Sai. Yes, they compromised by passing lower tariffs. Now, in contrast to um, Indian removal, nobody used nullification effectively in their paper. Everybody struggled with using nullification. I mean, some people, I was just reading one a minute ago that said that nullification, that Jackson did not protect the Constitution because of nullification. Well, I'm not sure that you could, you could effectively make that argument, right? You know, I mean, if anything, Jackson takes the stand that nullification was inconsistent with the Constitution. And pretty much, although he accepts you know, a tariff compromise, doesn't back down and accept nullification. Yet, I mean, the South Carolinians are going to nullify the force bill, and they're not going to, to kind of surrender this notion. But the union is preserved, and the nullification crisis is not really a clear-cut victory for either side, either Jackson or South Carolina. Now, the last thing in Jackson's administration, and there are numerous questions, probably four questions on the test about this, is the bank recharter, right? Now remember, the second bank of the United States had been chartered in 1816 for 20 years, right? It becomes an issue in the 1832 election. Oh, incidentally, who were the candidates in the 1832 election for presidency? Yes, go ahead, Simon. Yes, Jackson and Clay and Ritt for the uh, for the anti Masons, right? So basically, Jackson and Clay. So in the thirty-two election, the issue of the rechartering of the Bank of the United States comes up, right? Now, the bank was not set to go out of existence until uh, until eighteen thirty-six. How does it become an issue in eighteen thirty-two? Does anybody remember besides the instructor? how this issue gets into the election of 32. Go ahead, Hamza. It's the happiest moment of my life. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Clay and Webster and the Whigs try to make it an issue. And Congress does, in fact, Hamza, pass legislation that would recharter the bank, you know, for an additional 20 years. And it passes the House and it passes the Senate. Right? And it goes to Jackson, and Robbie, don't call me Bobby. What does Jackson do? He vetoes. He vetoes. Right? Now, what's wrong with that veto? I mean, there's a number of, you know, the, the critics of Jackson have problems with it. Go ahead. Uh, 
Yes, he vetoes it because he doesn't like the bank and it's considered to be his personal whim, and it is, it is, it is trumping the popular branches of government, right? You know, Congress represents the people in the states, they pass it, what right does the president have to veto it simply because he doesn't like it? What else? Uh, you want the um, people who were opposing Jackson believed it was his, him trying to gain Yes, that it was just a, a sheer act of power. And he also declared the bank unconstitutional. What was problematic with that, side? What was the case? Go ahead. Go, McCullough versus Maryland, right? You know, that it was, it was deemed constitutional. And so, this assertion of power by Jackson in the bank veto was considered to be a dangerous assertion of power. When he was basically saying by this single veto that the president had more power than Congress and more power than the Supreme Court, right? And, and, and several of you in your papers kind of effectively used the bank veto to make a case about constitutionality, balance of power. Not everybody, but enough, right? Made that, that case fairly effectively. So you should have a familiarity with the bank veto. Now, uh, the bank veto, the Maysville Road veto, uh, the aftermath of the bank veto when Jackson fires basically two Secretary of the Treasury in order to get them to withdraw funds from the Second Bank of the United States in order to destroy it early, right, which becomes his objective, right, all kind of coalesce with a belief amongst Jackson's opponents that Jackson was wielding dictatorial power and behaving like a king. So therefore, the party that emerges to, to, uh, to oppose Jackson and his policy becomes known as the Whig Party. Now, what we said was that the, the Whig Party was held together by a common hatred of Jackson. So what all of the Whigs believed was that Jackson yielded, wielded dictatorial power and was dangerous. Beyond that, there were differences, and we saw that today. We saw Harrison, you know, the elected president in 1840, believing in a traditional expansion, no, I shouldn't say expansionistic, um, um, a, a traditional Whig a, a agenda, which, which, um, which supported the American system and internal development, internal improvements, tariffs, the National Bank, and all of the things that Henry Clay had championed to building the country and using the national government to do so, and kind of nullification advocates who rejected Jackson because of nullification and wielding dictatorial power. And we saw Tyler versus Clay in that, right? Um, but we said the Whig Party is going to emerge, and in the election of 36, the Whigs will nominate three candidates, one of which was William Henry Harrison, in order to defeat um, um, Jackson's hand-picked successor, which was Martin Van Buren. Right? And by that time, both the Whigs and the Democrats had become national parties with organizations that tried to elect you know, representatives of those parties to Congress, to the Senate, to other positions throughout the country. Right? I mean, there are third parties, obviously, as well. But the Whigs and the Democrats are two parties. And we said, by the election of 1840, you really have a transformation politically with common people being more involved, white manhood suffrage, broader suffrage, broader participation, kind of a, a, a carnival environment of campaigning. You know, popular democracy had fully emerged. Right? Now, that takes us in to economic development in chapter 14 in your textbook. And what we said was that, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that America was transforming. As Jackson and Jacksonian democracy is emerging politically, at the same time, America was transforming. And we talked about the general transformation, that America was transforming from rural agrarian to urban industrial, and specifically that meant industrialization, urbanization, immigration, westward expansion, and the emergence of a market-style economy, right? And we talked about that. We talked about each of the elements of that. We talked about urbanization, which means that 
more and more Americans were living and working in cities. And we talked about the number of cities that were there that had more than 25,000 people and the number of cities with 100,000 people or more. And we talked about urbanization. We then talked about immigration, right? And we said that the 1840s and 1850s represented the largest percentage immigration in American history. And most of the immigrants that came in that time period, a huge influx of immigrants, came from two places. Does anyone remember the two places they came from? Go ahead, Jerry. The Irish and the German. And the largest group was the Irish. There are several questions about the Irish. What characteristics, Nate, do you recall about the Irish? They talked funny, besides that. They in the city. Yes, yes, they stayed in the city. And why did they stay in the city, Matt? Yes, they were such impoverished people, fleeing famine in, in Ireland, that when they came to America, they didn't have the resources to leave the cities that they came to. So they crowded into these cities, giving an appearance of more of them being there than actually were, even though it was a large influx. You know, they were kind of stuck in these urban areas. You know, huge populations of Irish. Well, besides their poverty, what else was disturbing? Go ahead. All right, you're on. You can start whenever you want, and I'll edit it out. All right. And post thank it thank you, Mr. Stakunis. Right. Put this on your in your room when I'm done. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I think that I think that late bell. You know, or not the late bell. The bell rang. So, I ma imagine there'll be a couple of other kids coming in. But we might as well get started. Boy, I was looking at this test, and it is a hard one. It's a good thing you kids came to this review session. Now, a couple of things to note here. That one, when you take the test on Thursday, you know you have a lot of time between now and then to, to get ready. But there are several exception questions where they say all of the following except. Those are those are tougher. You have to read those carefully. You know to make sure you should read everything carefully. Now, the, the test is going to start with the election of 1824, right? So, and in chapter 13. In chapter 13, we'll have probably more than any of the other four chapters, more questions in it. Definitely more, right? Definitely more. Probably 20, um, maybe more of the questions will be out of chapter 13. And that's Jackson, right? And Jackson came into our picture in our conversation with the election of 1824. If you remember, in terms of that election of 1824, there were four Republican candidates for president. One of them was Andrew Jackson, widely thought to be the least qualified because he had the least experience in government. Another was Henry Clay who was from Kentucky and had been the, and was the seated speaker of the House and intimately involved in a lot of the things that had happened, including the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which Clay was largely responsible for orchestrating. Another was William Crawford, who was the seated Secretary of Treasury in the Monroe administration. And Monroe, remember, was retiring from the, from the presidency. Another was John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy Adams was the Secretary of State in the Monroe administration. So you had four candidates, all claimed to be Republicans. The Federalist Party had pretty much faded away. There was no Federalist candidate that opposed um, Monroe in 1820, and so now there are four Republicans. And we know what happened. Who got the most votes in this election, electoral and popular? Say it, uh, Robbie, don't call me Bobby. Jackson got the most votes, but he was not elected by the Electoral College. Why not, Donovan? He got the most votes, popular and electoral, but he was not elected by the Electoral College. Why not? He did not receive 50% of the votes. So, Tad, where did the election go? House of Representatives. There they, they, they picked amongst the top three vote-getters. Uh, Henry Clay is going to use his influence in order to get John Quincy Adams to be elected to the presidency, which he is. What does Adams do after he is chosen by the House as president that becomes controversial? Does anybody remember besides the instructor? 
Now, Jillian, do you recall Adams' action in terms of an appointment in the wake of being elected president that becomes very controversial? Go ahead, Jillian, tell the kids. No, 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 that's Jackson a little later. But he makes a, Adams makes a very controversial cabinet decision. Who does he choose as his secretary of state? Clay. Clay. And this is, what, what, do, what do the Jackson people refer to this as? Uh, kind of taking his successor. And they, they called it what? It was picking his successor, as you said, and they called it something. Do you remember what they called it? There's a question on the test about this. They called it a corrupt bargain, right? A corrupt bargain. What was, dear Olivia, the corrupt bargain, you ask me? Well, here's what it was. The corrupt bargain was that Clay used his influence in order to get Adams elected by the House of Representatives. In return for that, Adams chose Clay to be Secretary of State, which in essence was naming his successor. Now, was there a corrupt bargain? That we don't know. Right? We don't know what kinds of conversation occurred, but we do know that the Jackson people believed that their man, Andrew Jackson, had been robbed of the presidency. And they declared a corrupt bargain, and both Clay and Adams will, will, will um, be, be saddled by that the rest of their political careers. Now, we know Adams goes on to be a relatively unsuccessful president for a number of reasons. One, his nationalistic vision was out of touch with the direction of the country. We said that, that, that he had none of the, the quali none of the, not the qualifications, but none of the characteristics of a good politician, right? He didn't necessarily want to pander to, um, to what kind of interests were out there. He wanted to assert what he thought was best. And this does not um, endear him to the public uh, at all. And so Adams has a very unsuccessful presidency. The Jackson people are conspiring to elect Jackson in 28, which they are successful in doing so. Now, we said that when Jackson is inaugurated to the presidency in 28, a large crowd of people come to Washington to watch Jackson's inauguration, right? And that, that huge crowd of common people that come for the first time to engage in, in um, in the inauguration is kind of a symbol of Jackson's ideology and what he's about, the common man becoming involved and influential in government. Now, initially, the two things that Jackson is going to be initially famous for in his first administration is one, the spoil system or rotation in office. Is there a difference between the spoil system and rotation in office, Josh? My feelings are hurt that he doesn't. Yes, go ahead. No, there's not. There's not a difference. You know, in both circumstances, what Jackson was doing is replacing a tenth of the federal government workforce with people he believed to be loyal to him. Right? Now, his critics, Josh, called it the spoil system and argued that Jackson was using his power of appointment to strengthen his own position by rewarding people who were supportive of him. Jackson defends it as rotation in office, saying that he was giving more people an opportunity to participate in government and to have these jobs which were easy enough to do, and he was breaking the power of an appointed aristocracy. Right? So they're, they're basically the same thing, but what they end up being is Jackson removing some people from, from appointed offices like postmasters and, and treasury officials and people in ports and other places that were employed by the federal government, removing them and replacing them with people of his choosing. And, and, and what his critics argued is this was a way to enhance his own power and to build his own strength. What he argued, it was democratic, right? The second thing that's going to happen in Jackson's first term, we did not directly talk about in class, but it was Indian removal. Everybody that wrote an essay discussed Indian removal, and it was, I mean, I should feel bad about this. 
It was the best used thing that anybody used. It was something I talk nothing about, right? You know, so um, it was almost everyone that used it used it effectively. It, it you know, it made sense. It, it saved like a number of papers from 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 generally, you know, maybe even a C to a B because they used it effectively. And what most basically most of you argued is that you could not consider the Jacksonians to be defenders of individual liberty given Indian removal. Right? And, and you know what transpired with Indian removal. There were the civilized tribes, and some of you wrote fairly well about this. The five civilized tribes, by, by Western standards, in Georgia and in the Southwest, who had basically adopted Western ways in an attempt to maintain their ancestral homelands, and that Jackson and his supporters wanted them removed, demanded that they sell or leave their land, and moved to Oklahoma. When, he re when they resisted, he removed them with force, and we generally call this the Trail of Tears. Jackson is going to be responsible for the Indian Removal Act of 1830, right, that pushed for Indian removal. Now, another issue that's going to occur in Jackson's uh, first administration and spill over into his second has to do with nullification. Now, nullification is the brainchild of John C. Calhoun. And it was proposed in the South Carolina Exposition and Protest by Calhoun in 1828. So 1828, Calhoun writes the South Carolina Exposition and Protest proposing the notion of nullification. What was the South Carolina Exposition and Protest a response to? Why was Calhoun raising this possibility of nullifying federal law? What was it a response to? Yes. Yes. Tariff that was passed in 1828 that was called the Tariff of Abomination. What, what was the idea of nullification? What did Calhoun argue? Yes, go ahead, Judge. Uh, that the Constitution was a compact between the different states, and that means that they're able to uh, disagree with something that's passed. Well, let's, let's, let's start with that. Calhoun did argue that the Constitution was a compact among sovereign states, and those states could judge the constitutionality of federal law. And they could do so by calling a special convention. And in that convention, determining whether a piece of federal law was consistent with the Constitution. If they deemed it inconsistent, they could nullify that federal law within the borders of their state. Right? And if after that nullification there was not a successful resolution between the national government and that state, that state could secede from the Union. Now, did South Carolina secede, or excuse me, they did not secede. But did South Carolina nullify a federal law in 1832? Yes. All right? What was Jackson's response to that? What was Jackson's, what, what was the total response to Jackson, South Carolina? Yes. The Force Act was passed by Congress to, to, to say to South Carolina that Jackson had the authority to use force to enforce. If the only, of, of one guy owned a 700, you would need 350 people to own two, right, to have the same number. So even though there were a lot less um, people that owned the larger number, they owned the majority of the people. And the, and the overwhelming number of people were subsistence farmers. They were people that didn't own any slaves, right? Yet, most people in the South were absolutely tenaciously connected to the institution of slavery. Right? Most Southerners, even if they didn't own slaves, largely because of racial prejudice and aspirations. If I don't own slaves, then someday I, may, I might. And that's the key to prosperity. So you want to take a good, hard look at chapter uh, 16 in your book, particularly the demographics. Who owns slaves? How many people own slaves? What about the non uh, Slaveholding, you know, African Americans. I, th I think I was reading in that chapter that there were about 250,000 free blacks in the North and about 250,000 free blacks in the South. 
And in both cases, those three blacks suffered racial discrimination, obviously. Right, obviously, in, but it wasn't heaven for them in the North either, right, you know, as well. And, and the other thing you want to look at in that chapter is how slavery affected the South. Because of slavery, the South really doesn't embrace any of the reforms, because those reforms were all associated with abolition, so they don't embrace anything. Immigrants don't go to the South. The Irish don't go to the South because they can't compete against slave labor. Urbanization doesn't take hold in the South, right? Because cities aren't necessary, you know, uh, and, and there isn't a vibrant kind of professional class that emerges. I mean, basically, slavery is going to define the South and constrict its, its development. It's going to be considered backward, you know, in terms of of the North. So there's lots to, um, to read about that. You should certainly read that, that chapter because there's lots of things in, 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 on the test that, that come out of that that we didn't talk about in class. Now, right, what we did talk about in chapter um, um, 16 was abolition, which is in the very end of that chapter. And the abolition movement that we talked about, we called a radical abolition abolitionist movement. And we define radical this way. We said radical meant that abolitionists in, in the North, starting with William Lloyd Garrison, maybe even David Walker, with David Walker's appeal. But Garrison is used, oh incidentally, what was the name of the newspaper that Garrison edited and published? Yes. Jared, this is the, the review session of you, you remember when, you, Armin, your friend had the class of his life today? This is the review session of your, of your life. Remember when Armin answered questions trying to make up for his sins, right, you know, of, of, of skipping the test and coming later in the day? Um, yeah, remember when he sinned like that? Uh, yes, but you, you are correct. It is called The Liberator. And, and the big edition of The Liberator was January 1, right, January 1st, um, 1831, where Garrison says, I will be heard. And what he says is that slaveholders should immediately um, emancipate their slaves. The slavery should be immediately abolished without compensation or without colonization. Remember, what was the name of the organization that was intended on recolonizing liberated slaves back to Africa? Does anybody remember? Yes. American the American Colonization Society. The failure of the American Colonization Society. Gradual emancipation with colonization is what leads to Garrison and others saying, forget it, slavery is a moral evil, it should be immediately abolished, right? And so we talked about some prominent abolitionists, which you should have a, a familiarity with, and we talked about the Southern response to abolition. You know, they are going to defend slavery now. It is going to be abolition and cotton that, that causes Southerners to change from considering slavery to be a necessary evil to defending it as a positive good, right? That slavery is good. Remember Calhoun's speech, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that slavery is bad, it is good, it is a positive good. It's in the Bible, it's good for the slave, it's good for the slaveholder, everyone benefits from it, leave us alone, right? Now, in order to defend slavery, they are going to open the mails, you know, the southern Postmasters will open the mail and destroy abolitionist sentiment and the gag rule. What was the gag rule? What was the gag rule? Does anybody remember? Yes, go ahead. In the Congress. So any petition that came into the Congress of the United States was immediately tabled. And when something is tabled, you can't talk about it. So it was a way to suppress discussion about slavery in Congress, the People's House, the gag rule. And then we talked briefly about northern opposition to slavery, right? And, or not to slavery, to, um, to abolition. And we talked, and we reviewed that today, the three reasons why northerners generally opposed radical abolitions. One, it potentially could destroy the Union. Two, it could destroy the economy. 
And three, the consequences of liberating four million ex-slaves or four million slaves might affect the labor market, among other things. And so we talked about that. Now, on the test, when you take it, there are going to be three sets of questions that will be associated with either a cartoon picture, um, a text, where you have to answer questions. And some of them will be about Jackson, some of them will be about slavery, and some of them will be about reform. So really, there'll be one about Jackson, one about slavery, and one about reform, because there's only three. And so we've already reviewed all three of those things. right? Now, does anybody have any other questions, anything else you want to go over before we conclude for the day? Hamsa, are you content with your review? All right. Well, then that's it for today. Matt, push the button. Do it. Do it.